<laughs> well, good morning, church. Glad to see you're all here with bright, shining faces and smiles on. What a beautiful day it is outside today. Great day to go out and mow the lawn. <laughs> Unfortunately. Well, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Oh, yeah. Hey, I've got to tell you, we can't rejoice in this. We're in trouble. So, hey, we got, uh, we got lesson number 10 out of 12 coming up for the Truth Project, the American Experiment. Now, this one here is kind of different, so it kind of plays off of the one we had before. It's called Stepping Stones, and for this tour, uh, we're going to remain down in that south, uh, southwest sector uh, of the compass long enough to examine that subcategory of the last topic, the design of the state. In particular, we're going to take a look at the question, what should God's minister on earth? And what is a proper form for this agency that is divinely appointed and commissioned to administer justice, punish evil, and encourage goodness among its citizens and subjects. And we're going to do that by considering what is called the American Experiment. So it's a really, really good uh, section. And so I invite you all to try and make it here for that. Yesterday, we had orange track racing right here. And we had a small but mighty crowd because it's vacation time. Everybody's out there kind of doing their thing. Uh, but it was really fun. We had, we had uh, some I mean, absolutely awesome races going on here, like photo finish races going on, which we don't normally have, but I mean, a couple of them were too close to call. I know one, I think we had to run over again because it, we couldn't see. So it was, it was kind of neat. Our next orange track racing is going to be August 13th. So if you feel free to come out for that. And of course we have Gray Street Cinema coming up again in September. This will be September 17th, and it'll be the movie Tulsa. And uh, that's going to be a really good movie as well. Hopefully, we won't need the tissues quite as much in this one here. Eh, maybe a little bit. So, but it, it should be a really, really good time. And so, I uh, still want to try and see what we can do for this fall type time to get together, just kind of a church get together, a little picnic type thing. Uh, so, be thinking about that. Give us some suggestions. Let's try and pin down a time frame so that we can make it happen um, and see what we can do there. So a lot of good things, a lot of fun things coming up here. And so uh, we look forward to that. Our call to worship that Pastor Terry has chosen this morning comes from Zephaniah 3, verse 15. And this is from the New Living Translation. For the Lord God will remove his hand of judgment and will disperse the armies of your enemy. And the Lord himself, the King of Israel, will live among you. At last, your troubles will be over, and you will never again fear disaster. Wow, what a promise. I mean, that's awesome. I guess we should never worry about anything else for the whole rest of our lives, right? I mean, let's read that. God has reversed his judgments against you and sent your enemies off, chasing their tails. From now on, God is Israel's king, in charge at the center. There's nothing to fear from evil ever again. God is present among you forever. Now that's a little bit different translation of that same exact verse. But it really emphasizes what God was doing for the people of Israel. He was laying waste to the enemies. He was getting rid of those things that were distractions to the people of Israel that were keeping them away from God's presence. So it's kind of kind of awesome. So after the promises of taking away sin, following the promises of taking away trouble, what an awesome promise that God made. What an awesome foretelling of what God was going to do for the people. Well, in science, when we see that it, when the cause is removed from any specific object, then the effect of that cause will cease. So that's what turned as a cause and effect relationship. So if you take away the cause of the problem over here, guess what? The problem goes away. Isn't that an awesome thing to think about? 
So when we think about that, I like to look at that verse as a cause and effect relationship. The cause of the problems, the evils, and the enemies that were coming against the people of Israel, God was taking care of them. He was removing it. He was taking all those stressors off of their life and getting rid of them. So I think that's absolutely awesome. What makes people holy, then, will make them happy. So I've, I've kind of put a bunch of little verses in here, things, things to think about. So what makes people holy will make them happy. The promises to make the purified people, the believers, were able then to have full success in the gospel message that God had planned for them. So as he removed all the things that kept them away from God, those people became holy. They became happy. When you're happy, you're going to do things more often. And so God was bringing those people back into his presence and giving them a way to have that full relationship with him. And these verses chief, uh, chiefly appear to relate to the future conversion and restoration of Israel and those glorious times that were to follow. And that lays into the prophecies of Isaiah and Jeremiah and all the other things that God had said. Hey, listen to what I'm saying here. I have a future for you guys planned. And it's a glorious, peaceful future because it shows that abundant peace, the comfort, the prosperity, being members of God's church, being that family that we are brought together. We are then becoming the family of God. That gives us something to rejoice about. So as we started that verse in Proverbs that we have in here, uh, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. This is what makes us glad. This is what enables us to be happy, to have glad, to have comfort and peace and prosperity as the family of God. The happy times are here in the midst of all this stuff in the world. The happy times with God are here. He will save. He will be Jesus. He will answer for that name and he will save the people from their sins. Thanks be to God. Let's go to God in prayer as we start this time of worship. Father God, we just praise you and thank you for this message that we can settle upon our hearts, that we are to rejoice in your presence, that you have given us a glorious future. Lord, we thank you for giving this message and putting it upon Terry's heart today so that we can share more in your word, your good word, your message that you have for us to live our lives out in your presence. Rejoice, be glad, have peace, take comfort in my name, says the Lord. That's it says every time cross stones. goes across. See what it says on the screen? Stepping stones. Good <laughs> <laughs> observation, <laughs> Dennis. There. Okay, okay. But now you can't hear me. Check, check. Check, check. Well, we we'll just try this right. really quick. That's on too, so. But I had to turn it down when Rick used it yesterday. So. Check, 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 check. I'm back. Back now. <laughs> Technology is great. When it works. When it works. Yes. It's like fishing cat five. <laughs> <laughs> you can tell I'm not an electrician because I chose cat five instead of. Yeah. Six. <laughs> Well, you got six. Six. Or five, eight, you know. How about seven, eight? That's the new one. <laughs> the problem is, this technology moves way too fast. All right. So, yes, stepping stones. We talked about that a little bit uh, a few weeks ago. Almost a month ago, I think, now that uh, we first mentioned stepping stones. But, when you think about stepping stones, I think about um, paths that have been laid before us. Um, years ago, when we moved into our house, one of the things that drew, uh, that Diane loved, was the pond out back. And 
ultimately we had to take the pond apart and drain it because there was a pine tree that they had planted right next to it and it just filled it full of junk and unfortunately squirrels would fall into it and they couldn't get out but the, the point of it is is that when we dismantled it we took the stones that were around it and we created a stepping stone path back to where uh, Callie our dog's kennel was and so now when I think of stepping stones as I was writing this all I could see is this this path that uh, I take a lot of time uh, throughout the course of the mowing season to keep clean because it gets grown over so quickly so that's that analogy is as the stepping stones get grown over just think about that as you listen to the message this morning now last week mark talked about a lot to do with the declaration of independence the constitution uh, he mentioned the bill of rights and and of course i went out this week and i got on youtube and i looked up um, the uh, schoolhouse rock videos and I watched the ones on the Bill of Rights and the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence and conjunctions and <laughs> oh wait, I, I went down a rabbit hole on that <laughs> <laughs> exactly and, and I was good I thought oh wouldn't that be neat to put in this sermon and then I remembered that we'd probably get a copyright violation for <laughs> posting it online so um, We'll have to post, I'll have to post the links over the course of the next week of, of those because besides school, that's how we learned about the American government. And unfortunately, they quit showing those back in 2002. But part of what, uh, a big part of what Mark was teaching about last week was God's design for the state. And we're going to talk about that a little bit more this morning. Because it's when our forefathers came to what be, would become the United States, they came with a comprehensive biblical world view. Not just a biblical world, but it was comprehensive. They knew the scriptures. And as they went through and they were setting things up and they were moving forward, did they get it right all the time? Probably not, no. But they did their best based on what they knew from this. This was how they moved forward. Let's start this morning with Isaiah 33, verse 22. And as you listen to this, think about what you hear in this passage that may sound very familiar to you. Isaiah 30, or 33, 22. For the Lord is our judge, our lawgiver, and our king. He will care for us and save us. Now we heard three things in that passage. Judge, lawgiver, and king. Now let's take that a little bit. That's go hundreds, even thousands of years forward. And the next thing, what we can take from this is judicial, legislative, executive. This foundation, or this passage laid the foundation for the three branches of government. They line up almost perfectly. So let's dig a little bit deeper into this passage and, and most likely what they took from that. See, this chapter is the sixth and final prophetic message of woe against Assyria. It focuses on Assyria's defeat and Judah's exaltation. And through it, the Lord, the King of Judah, is exalted. God, as our lawgiver, determined what is right and what is wrong. And I say that in the past tense because he doesn't change what is right and what is wrong. He laid that out at the foundation of the world. And through the scriptures, God shows us how we should live, or if you prefer, not to live. 
I, I think back to when I was writing, I, I thought back to a time when I met with a former manager of mine. I was working for uh, Hardee's at the time and I met with my former manager and she was the district manager at that point. And I, I looked at her and we were having, we sat down and we were having coffee and I said, I just don't know what to do with this manager of mine. He doesn't do anything right. The words of advice that she gave me were these. Then do what he, or don't do what he does and do what he doesn't do. So live or work the way that he isn't. So it, it can be looked at either way and, and looked at in a positive way rather than a negative way. God is also our judge who sees the wrongs, or if you prefer, sins that we do, and he pronounced judgment. Now that, how he handles that judgment changes from the sacrifices in the Old Testament to the final sacrifice in the New Testament. But we're not going to get too much into that at the moment. Here's the other piece. God is also a king because what he is has authority over everything. But there's more to it than just that. Just although God is our lawgiver, he is also the giver of grace and forgiveness. So he not only set the laws, but he gave us a way. To fulfill and although he is our judge he took the judgment for our sins on himself through his son Jesus Christ and although God is our king through Jesus he came to earth oh, I hear a song in my head now it's gonna be hard to get out of there he humbled himself by becoming like us he became human and then he died on the cross so if we go back to the second part of Isaiah 33, 22, he said, he will care for us and save us. And he does that through being the judge, the lawgiver, and the king. Now Mark read from Zephaniah 3, 15 this morning, it says, For the Lord will remove his hand of judgment and will disperse the armies of of your enemy and the Lord himself the King of Israel will live among you at last your troubles will be over and you will never again fear disaster it's through Jesus that he handles these three roles judge lawgiver and king but not like what we do they were handled perfectly we, on the other hand, tend to get really lopsided in the way that we do things, and we get turned around, and we don't necessarily do things right. And we can see that throughout history, whether it was the Israelites or even now as we look at our own government. We don't have always get everything right. And even if we do get something right, that doesn't mean it's uh, received properly. Yeah, it's still an amazing guide on how we can govern well. That's what God has given us, a guide to govern ourselves. Because man can't govern himself. We can't even obey our own rules. I've said this way too many times, but you can't even stop at the stop sign. It's kind of a slow and go. Or yesterday as I was leaving here, you know, we've got brand new lines painted out here to tell you where to stay in your lane to take the left out onto Marion Boulevard and yet I almost got pancaked because somebody came all the way into my lane. We can't do it ourselves but God has given us a model and it is a model that is designed to keep people from misusing their power. So judge, lawgiver, and king Jesus is that perfectly, but for us, we have to have three separate pieces to that. Now, are we close with this American experiment that we've been in? 
I had to have a little bit of fun with this one. We start off really well, but let's hop into the Wayback Machine and go back to 1777. And if you may or may not be old enough to remember Sherman and Mr. Peabody. Mm -hmm. yes. I watched these guys on repeat when I was a kid, and apparently there was a movie that came out a few years ago that I'm going to have to investigate now because I love Mr. Peabody and Sherman and the Wayback Machine. But let's go back to 1777. Why we're going back there is very specific. It's because the early education in the colonies was dependent on two texts. The first text was this, the Bible. And that's going to pop up on the screen. There we go. This is kind of what one of the Bibles may have looked like you know, a few hundred years ago. But then they also regarded or used the New England primer or as as uh dr tackett will correct me in my pronunciation primer primer <laughs> and this was an amazing book I, I down the rabbit hole i went and i started reading through this and what it does is it teaches you the alphabet and how to pronounce words but what it does within that is it comes back to this book to teach those truths and that how that happens. And then shortly at, at a certain point about uh, oh, late 1700s, early 1800s, this, the primer was replaced by this. Now it says the elementary spelling book on it, but it was actually uh, much better known as Webster's Blue Black Speller. And that was because of the color. What it reminded me of was those awful books that they would hand us at finals time in college that had a blue cover and a bunch of lined paper in it that was empty. And then they would go up and for the young people in our audience, it was called a chalkboard. There's this little piece of, you do it on the sidewalks, but they would go up to the, the board and they would write a question. And then the fear would come into everybody's eyes when the professor would say, if you need another one of the blue books, just let me know. <laughs> I was trying to figure out how I was going to fill the first one. <laughs> but these were the things that they used. And, and Noah Webster, this is the guy who would eventually write the dictionary. And he took this and expanded upon it. He changed some of the spelling of the word. So uh, Savior in English is I-O-U-R instead of O-U-R. So he changed some of those spellings to make it more Americanized, but they left the words intact. Now our early education system just simply instilled the principles of biblical Christianity and they did it through this to begin with in the 1600s when they first came over. Eventually in the late 1600s and through the late 1800s it was the primer and then <coughs> the elementary spelling book which sold a lot of copies and was almost another hundred years before it would be replaced. learning biblical doctrine along with prayer in schools was essential to early American and colonial education. Now, we all have heard of the NEA or the National Education Association and, and um, they have been a very liberal viewpoint on a lot of things, including education. I wonder what the current NEA today would think of this statement from 1892. And understand, this is the NEA. If the study of the Bible is to be excluded from all state schools, if the inculcation of the principles of Christianity is to have no place in the daily program, if the worship of God is to form no part of the general exercises of these public elementary schools, then the good of the state would be better served 
by restoring all schools to church control. National Education Association, 1892. A statement made because they saw education starting to go the wrong way. <coughs> now let's let's step back a bit. Let's, we're going to go back. We're going to jump in the Wayback Machine. I don't have another graphic for it, but we're going to go back to the Wayback Machine to 1642 to Puritan, Massachusetts, where they passed a law that all children needed to learn to read. And here's the reason for that. It was their belief that illiteracy was Satan's way to keep people from the scriptures, to keep people from God. Unfortunately, by the early 1900s, the fears of the NEA had started to become reality. And this comes from the late, or the name, September of 1933 in Teacher Magazine. It's a something that was written by John Dewey. And John was took to the subscription of Darwin and some of the others. He said, faith in the prayer hearing God is an unproved and outmoded faith. There is no God and there is no soul. Hence, there are no needs for the props of traditional religion. With dogma and creed excluded, then immutable truth is also dead and buried. There is no room for fixed natural law or moral absolutes. I felt so sorry for him at that point as I read that. He had a unfortunately had an incredible impact on education and not in a good way. But he was also a signer of the first of three humanist manifestos, the first being signed in 1933. The basis of the document, document was the removal of God because, as Dewey stated, there is no God. I'm sorry, Dewey, but God's not dead. But when we look at what the NEA stated in the late 1800s and just 50-ish years later, 51 years later, what he is stating, how far the educational system had fallen. Now, on Wednesday night, Dr. Tackett, we'll talk more about this, including the foundation and, and also the original mottos of, say, Harvard, Princeton, and Columbia, because when you look at those compared to what they are today, they are night and day. But here's the thing. These books, these things that have been left for us, they are like what we talked about a few weeks ago. They are memorial stones. And God, as you remember, uses memorial stones for the Israelites to remember things, remember events. If you remember back then, we talked about Genesis 28, that after a dream, Jacob took the stone that he had used as a, can you imagine that as a pillow? And not real soft. But he took that, that rock and it became part of a memorial pillar. And he named the place Bethel, or House of God. And then we also talked about Joshua 4, where God commanded the Israelites to remove 12 stones from the Jordan River. After everyone had crossed, he, they sent 12 representatives into the river while it was still dry to grab 12 stones, and they brought them over, and they created another memorial to remind themselves and their children and future generations of the miraculous assistance and goodness and love of God. Those that have gone before us here in the United States or the colonial United States, those that went before us did the same thing for us as well. There are monuments around the country that are memorials or, or memorial stones for us. Now you don't have to drive real far. You can just go down First Avenue Bridge. There's a miniature statue of Lady Liberty there. I've never seen the you know, 
the, the original in New York someday. But that's one. But in our nation's capital, Washington, D.C., there are a bunch. I mean, that's probably the greatest concentration of memorial stones that exist. There's war memorials. We just saw last week in the movie, the Vietnam Memorial. There's memorials for the, the individual presidents. There's memorials celebrating the Emancipation Proclamation. And there's a, even a memorial there celebrating the civil rights leader, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Now I'm Winston, and see, I like to, I'm, I'm being a little vague here because I want you to join us on Wednesday night because Dr. Tackett is going to share a very personal, special journey during the study about what he experienced when he was an advisor for the president. And he's going to talk about the, mur the murals in the, rotunda, the Capitol Rotunda, the story they tell, and how at their very heart, they are Christian. Here's the unfortunate part. Remember when we talked about historical revisionism? Well, that is happening more and more at an accelerated pace because something it just upsets other people. And, and I say that a little bit. <laughs> I'm sorry. That was good. <laughs> it, I, I, but if I don't agree with something, I don't let it bother me to the point that I demand its removal. I don't, I, I try to learn about it and understand where they're coming from so that I could potentially have a conversation. I miss being able to sit across the table from somebody and have a conversation and both, we may not come to any agreement whatsoever, but we walk away with a handshake and as friends. I miss that. But historical revisionism is causing things to be removed and we must be careful because remember what we talked about somebody i and the name at the moment escapes me but he said there will only be one bible left and it will be in a museum and it will only be as a reminder of something that happened at one time in our history right now we are warned let's go to revelation chapter 2 verses 4 and 5 <coughs> This is Jesus speaking, and this is the message to the church in Ephesus. But I have this complaint against you. You don't love me or each other as you did at first. Look how far you have fallen. Turn back to me and do the works you did at first. If you don't repent, I will come and remove your lampstand from its place among the churches. I think we need to unpack that a little bit. Jesus is telling us we need to do what first? We need to remember, and then we need to repent, and then we need to return. So let's think about this. When you first came to know Jesus, was your love for him strong? Was, did it feel like it was just <coughs> flowing out of me and you didn't know it? I, I, when I gave my life to Christ, I was a young kid, but when I turned it over to him 100%, Oh, it felt like everything is just flowing out of every extremity. Like, I just, and then over time, what happens? The world happens. <laughs> Has my faith waned? No, it's grown stronger. But that mountaintop high that I felt, there's also valleys that you walk through as well. If we look at where it's talking about you don't love me or each other. Jesus was talking first to Israel, then to the church, and to everything that came after that, including here in the United States, us as a country. There are so many cultures around the world that at one time that they identified as whatever, because of their religious beliefs. Now the name is simply tied to their more or less like their race rather than their beliefs. So there are, as an example, the Jews. 
they were, they're God's people. Yet there's a lot of Jews today that identify as Jews, but it's more of a race rather than a religion. It's a secular. Now, for God's people, this means that we've forgotten his love. It has led us to a society that is very self-centered or narcissistic, if you prefer, where the turn or the phrase "it's all about me" comes to mind. Now, several years ago, and, and again, I found it on YouTube, and I wanted to play it, but I'll have to post up the link to it. There was a parody song that came out, a Christian parody song called "It's All About Me." Here's the thing, though. Jesus, in this passage, is calling us back. He's calling us to see the error of our ways. He's calling us to repent. And if we do not return to Jesus, what does he tell us? He tells us that he will remove the lampstand from its place. I think we need to talk about what that means. Because context is everything. And in this passage, it meant the church in Ephesus would lose its standing as a church. The church would cease to be effective for the kingdom. Now, they may still continue to good, do good things for other people, but are they doing it for God or are they doing it for themselves? And then the, Jesus is telling them they're doing it for themselves. Now, the lampstand, that candlestick that they're talking about, was the branched candlestick that was in the temple that allowed the priests to see. If they remove that candlestick, what happens? They can't see. They'd be poking around in the dark. If the church is the light to the community, and the light is removed, what happens to the church? The church and the people of the church might still, like the church in Ephesus, may still be doing good things that benefit the community. Maybe helping a, a food pantry or, or a shelter or any number of other things. But if they're doing it for themselves to say, look what I have done, as opposed to looking what God has done. In my readings this morning, I was reading about Hezekiah, and Hezekiah became ill. And Isaiah told him, you're going to die. God said, this is, you're going to die because of this. And what did he do? He went and he got on his hands and knees and he prayed to God. And before Isaiah had even left the courtyard, God gave him a message. Go back. Tell Hezekiah. Going to give, I heard his prayer and I will extend his life another 15 years. Wow. And here's the problem he had visitors come after this and he showed them everything that he had. And it wasn't, look what God gave me, but look what I have acquired. And Isaiah would bring the prophecy to him that all those things would be taken from. Judah. If it is not being done for God, it will last. Mark and I have conversation after conversation about our church and what can we do to have more people join us? And I've been soul searching on this quite a bit and it's there are churches out there that are growing but they fall into this where the lampstand has been removed and even though they're growing they're growing for the wrong reasons and there are churches out there that are doing wonderful things the people are growing spiritually and they're they're reaching out to the community yet they don't grow or they might even shrink I think I'd rather be the latter than the former. Don't get me wrong, I want to see our church grow and I want us to make an impact on our community and beyond. 
but I want to do it for the right reasons. So getting back to the American experiment, what has gotten in the way? Unfortunately, it's been man's design for the state, kind of what we just talked about, man's design for the state. It has been just 60 years since the U.S. Supreme Court declared on June 26th, 20, excuse me, June 25th, 1962. I mean, it's been nearly almost 60 years to the day that school-sponsored prayers were declared unconstitutional. It all stemmed from a lawsuit over a non-denominational prayer that was recommended, now let hear this, to the school districts by none other than the New York, and this is the, here's the irony in this, the New York Board of Regents. They had not gone left yet. Listen to this prayer. Almighty God, we acknowledge our dependence upon thee and we beg thy blessings upon us, our parents, our teachers, and our community. <laughs> and a handful of people and their kids said, uh -uh, I don't want to do that. Now, it's been argued for decades now, and I say decades because we're talking 60 years, that has led that this case that over this prayer has led to the decline in our nation's moral fiber because God was removed from schools. It is in this that we can see how much has changed in the 70 years, or excuse me, that over over 100 years, almost 120 years, the NEA statement. It's been argued that the moral decay of our society, of our country, has accelerated because of the difference between this and the removal of current schools. Now, another rabbit hole to go down. I spent way too much time doing this and neither side could give concrete evidence of one way or another. And after about three hours, I decided I shouldn't probably be spending any more time on it. But I have, so what all I have is my perception. And this is my perception. I'm not gonna cite any studies or anything. This is my perception. But it's my perception that, yes, our moral fiber has decayed. And I believe that we need revival. And the only way to get revival is to go back to what it said in Revelation 2, where we need to remember, we need to repent, so the, and then we need to return. Remember, repent, and return. That's what will bring revival. Our founding fathers understood the importance of religion and morality, and God's design for the state was what the founding fathers had in mind. In fact, we'll hear on Wednesday night a, quote, a, for, or a, a piece from Benjamin Franklin, who arguably was the least believing member of the Founding Fathers, yet he said we needed a return. Religion and morality, I, I, you know, I, I put my notes, religion and morality went hand in hand. That's a past tense. Religion and morality go hand in hand. Here's what Noah Webster had to say about it in 1836. He said, in my view, the Christian religion is the most important and one of the first things in which all children under a free government ought to be instructed. No truth is more evident to my mind than that the Christian religion must be the basis of any government intended to secure the rights and privileges of a free people. It's been argued over and over again whether or not America was founded as a Christian nation. Those that argue against it 
need to go deeper into the writings of the time and the writings of our founding fathers and those around them. But today, right now, it doesn't feel like it. But our founding fathers were Christians. And the decisions that they made were based on their faith. And I've heard politicians recently in the last 10 or 20 years say that they are able to compartmentalize. Now, I get it. Guys, disposably, we have these boxes in our heads and we can compartmentalize them, everything. And we only worry about one thing at a time. We don't, we're not wired the same. But they, these politicians have said, I can have my faith here and I can have my job as, as a politician here. And they don't cross. And I'm sorry, I'm <laughs> not sure how that works. Because everything that I am and every part of my, every fiber of my being is influenced by my faith. And if I did not have that faith, every part of my more fiber would be from whatever that was. So let's, let's look at a portion of uh, George Washington's farewell address in uh, September 1796. It says, and let us with caution indulge the supposition that morality can be maintained without religion. Reason and experience both forbid us to expect that national morality can prevail in exclusion of religious principle. And it wasn't just Washington. This was a consistent theme across our founding fathers. Washington, John Adams, Benjamin Rush, Charles Carroll, Samuel Adams, Patrick Henry, and the list goes on and on and on. In fact, Benjamin Rush wrote this. He wrote this, uh, this is two different quotes from a defense of the use of the Bible as a school book from 1798. First one is, the only foundation for a republic is to be laid in religion. The second, Christianity is the only true and perfect religion, and that in proportion as mankind adopt its principles and obey its precepts, they will be wise and happy. Our founding fathers, they saw the strong connection between virtue and liberty. And this is why the Declaration of Independence begins. And Mark, Mark read this last week, and it's, I, it's, this is important. So I'm going to read it again this week. This is, it says, in Congress, July 4th, 1776. And this is, I know you can't read this, and I didn't intend for it. This is, this is what that first page looked like. It's a little faded. This is from the archives. But this is what it starts off saying right here. When in the course of human events, it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with one another, or with another and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and the nature of, and of nature's God entitle them. And we're going to come back to this. Laws of nature and of nature's God entitle them. And then it goes on, it says, A decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which impel them to the separation. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their Creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And I, as you can see, it goes on much further, but that's that's where I want to be here. One of the lines that I just read is so often under, misunderstood, and that's the one I wanted to, that I paused on. And so to best understand this passage, the laws of nature and, and of nature's God entitle them, we have to go back to the 1600s. And we have to go back to a quote, uh, this was said by Sir Edward Coke. He said, the law of nature, and this is the same law of nature that is written into the Declaration, the law of nature is that which God, at the time of creation of the nature of man, infused into his heart for his preservation and direction, the moral law, called also the law of nature. The problem is this, this is read at face value without understanding the context. Without understanding that context, 
the meaning is lost. Now you can understand why Mark and I beat that drum so hard all the time. Context, context, context. Everything that the Founding Fathers did was to prevent the overreach of the government because they had seen it happen time and time again in other countries, and we continue to see it happening time and time again in other countries. It just perpetuates itself. That is why we have the separation of powers, judicial, legislative, and executive, and they hold each other in check. It prevents any one part of, that, of our government of getting out of control. Here is where religion and morality meet. If God is removed, then the reality is that people will do whatever they want. They will write whatever laws they want based on their perception, not on morality. Without God, there is no moral compass to guide us. Now, granted, Paul writes in, in thir Romans 13, 1, that everyone must submit to governing authorities. But here's the question, without God, how will those same governing authorities know what is good and what is evil, what is right and what is wrong? If they don't know what's right and wrong or good and evil, that's a, that's a dangerous path to be. Remember the, the path I was talking about? That's the weeds taking over the path. Without God, those governing authorities are going to do what is best for us Put that in the form of a question. No. They're going to do what's right for them. The mantra has now become, times have changed and so should we. This has led us to something known as legal positivism. There's a, another $10 wood. What does that mean? It's the claim that the state is the ultimate authority for creating, interpreting, and enforcing the law. While legal truth is based on the decisions of the state. In other words, the government controls everything you say, do, or want. And unfortunately, you know, this is really crazy because this was a biological thing. Darwin was talking about the theory of evolution. He's talking about how we came from a little thing of ooze and became but his theory of evolution and the way that that process, his thought process, it crept into first how law was studied and then into our educational system. This would lead us to what became known as evolving law. In other words, a law that's not based on logic, but experience. Now you, you, You've probably seen how this could go sideways in so many different ways. But here's the problem. It's been ever so slowly that things have changed. Kind of goes back to Mark talked about the frog in the, in the, the water. If you throw it in a pot of boiling water, it's going to know right away. But if you slowly turn up the heat, by the time it gets too hot, it's too late. The state is becoming the ultimate authority for determining what is right and wrong for us instead of God. And historical revisionism has stripped God and Christianity from what really happened when the pilgrims came to this land. Now, if we go back a month, we remember when we talked about the Mayflower Compact? I think I have them out of order. There we go. This was the original. In the name of God, amen, we whose names are underwritten, having undertaken for the glory of God an advancement of the Christian faith, a voyage to plant the first colony. But then we look at the, the new school version, and it just becomes we whose names are underwritten, having undertaken a voyage to plant the first colony. <coughs> Apparently, we can just redact whatever we don't like. Their intent And this is not current, this is the intent of those who went before us, was the preservation and propagation of the truth and liberties of the gospel. Through historical revisionism, 
our founders have been depicted as deists and secularists stripping God and Christianity from all historical accounts, pursuing a secular basis for law. We saw this happen after World War II. Anything that happened that had anything to do with the war and the things that led up to the war were stripped from the Japanese history books. What path has this left us on? And not just us, but those who come after us, our kids and their kids and our, you know, our descendants. These are the stepping stones. People have forgotten who God is. Now, I, I can't be too discouraged because as we read through the Bible, this is something that happens over and over and over again with the Israelites. It's a cycle, that, it's a, just a cycle on repeat. Hosea said this in 13, 4 and 6, I have been the Lord your God ever since I brought you out of Egypt. You must acknowledge no God but me, for there is no other Savior. I took care of you in the wilderness, in that dry and thirsty land. But when you had eaten and were satisfied, you became proud and forgot me. God takes care of us. And then we get comfortable. What happens when we get comfortable? We forget what God did. The memorial stones are there. We need to pay attention to them before political correctness makes them disappear forever. We need to remember, repent, and return. Because this takes us right back to, I'm going to just circle right back to the very beginning, Zephaniah 3.15. For the Lord will remove his hand of judgment and will disperse the armies of your enemy. And the Lord himself, the King of Israel, will live among you at last. Your troubles will be over and you will never again fear disaster. Here's the thing. Even if Jesus removes the lampstand, we as children of God have hope because what happens? Light overtakes darkness. At home, I was thinking of that this morning, we have blackout shades in every room in the house except for the kitchen. But here's the thing, we've got ceiling fan. <laughs> it's like the Holy Spirit. I, I was, that's, this is where God had me thinking. The fan is the Holy Spirit. It's causing the curtains to do this and what's happening when that happens, the light comes through. The light pierces the darkness. John 1.5 says this, the light shines in the darkness and the darkness can never extinguish it. And then John writes this in 12, 44 and 46. And this is from the message version. It says, Jesus summed it all up when he cried out, whoever believes in me, believes not just in me, but in the one who sent me. Whoever looks at me is looking in fact, at the one who sent me, I am the light that has come into the world so that all who believe in me won't have to stay any longer in the dark. Now, to close out in prayer, I had a prayer that I was going to pray and then I, my devotional is from uh, the year in the Bible with uh, Nikki and Pippa Gumbel. His prayer at the very end, it, it just fit too well. God has a way of doing that. He puts things right in front of us, right at the time that we need them. Join me in this prayer that Nikki wrote. He said, this is the prayer. Lord, as we look around at the state of our city, our nation, and our world, we need your deliverance. You alone are God over all the kingdoms of the earth. You made heaven and earth. Give ear, O Lord, and hear. Open your eyes, O Lord, and see. Pour out your Holy Spirit again. 
May we see people seeking your name again. May we see miracles of healing. May we see the evangelization of our nation, the revitalization of the church, and the transformation of society so that all kingdoms on earth may know that you alone, O oh Lord, are God. Amen. 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 So as we come into this time of communion this morning, as Pastor Terry was giving his messages today, all these thoughts kept pouring into my head. And when we think about that human manifesto, the humanist manifesto that was written, and it's written in three different parts, but it was written with people who had darkened hearts, who didn't know God, who said God doesn't exist. See, they were still living in that fallen state. We went, I, I go all the way back to when we talked about the states of man. And they were living in a fallen state where God didn't exist. They were outside of that sphere of God and they were cast out to the side. They had dark hearts. He was talking about the light coming in to the world. And so as he went on through his message this morning, he talked about legal positivism. And I haven't heard that term in quite a long time. But really, if you think about it, legal positivism is what nailed Jesus to the cross. See, the Romans, that was a state government where the state was in control of everything. And the state was the God. The Caesar was a God. He declared himself a God. That's legal positivism where they, they make all the moral determinations for everybody else. And see, the believers, those with a pure heart, with a light heart. Those who weren't living in a fallen state, they were the ones who nailed Jesus to the cross. It wasn't the believers. It was the ones who were living in that state, that legal positivism. Those are the ones who actually nailed him to the cross. But if it wasn't for them, God brought us out through that because they thought, once they nailed him to the cross, it was all over. He was done. It's all over. We won. But they didn't. See, by nailing Jesus to the cross, God proved out himself. It gave us that path for salvation. It gave us a path for eternal life through Jesus, through his death on the cross. That killed the sin. The fallen state was now lifted light now poured out where there was only darkness before we were taken from that fallen state and put back into a right relationship with God see in that one act we remembered we repented and we returned to God's presence through Jesus and his act on the cross so as we take communion today I want you to think about that that act is a restoration for us. It took us out of a dark and fallen state and put us back into that right relationship from God. God allows evil to exist in the world. God allows evil to exist in the world because it proves out his glory. Kind of gives us somewhere to go from a fallen state and back into a restored relationship return to his presence so on the night that Jesus was betrayed he knew what was to be fallen ahead of time and he said this is my body which is broken for you take and eat later on in the meal he took the cup and after he had blessed he said this is the cup my blood shed for you, the new covenant, that new relationship with God. Take and drink. And each time that you take of this bread and drink of this cup, do it in remembrance of me. So as we think about this today, this is our chance to remember, to repent, and to return to the presence of God. The body of Christ broken for you. The 
blood of Christ shed for you. protection because they are being bombarded with evil. So this morning we will pray for them and um, we'll pray for Beckham and my friend Kenna and um, we just want to praise God first for baby Ebenezer who was born to Sarah Antonin on July 4th and we thank Jesus for him and, and many blessings be upon them all. So is there any anyone else would like prayer this morning? Mm -hmm. I'd like to lift up Vivian. We've been praying for her and her mother uh, who lives in Canada. Uh, her mother did pass away earlier mm -hmm. this week. Mm -hmm. so Sorry to hear that. Um, we kind of hear the end of your family. Yes. Okay. Anyone else? So, okay. Father God, as we come to you in prayer this morning, <clears throat> and we'd like to first lift up the Supreme Court judges. They are on attack. They have been attacked, Father God, because they chose to do your will. And we pray for protection, put a hedge of protection around them, an army around them to keep them and their families safe from the evil ones of this earth. And we just pray for wisdom and knowledge for them. Give that to them, Lord God, so they can govern as you want them to govern our United States. Thank you, Jesus. And we lift up Vivian and her family this morning as her mother has passed away. We pray for comfort and um, healing and restoration for all of them, Lord Jesus. For you are God, and you can give them peace that passes all understanding if they come to you. And we just pray for them this morning, Lord God. We just keep them in your love and care. And um, <clears throat> Father God, we praise your name for you are holy and all healing we ask in your name by your name by your will only will it be done so we humbly ask for healing for Beckham not just the physical scars but for the emotional and mental scars that can cripple a person with the trauma that he has experienced please heal him completely in Jesus holy name and we lift up Kenna to you this morning. They did an MRI, or they did an ultrasound on her heart and found fluid around her heart. And I would just ask that you heal her heart like only you can. I rebuke the spirit of infirmity that has been formed against her, Father God. Let the blood of Jesus wash over her and cleanse her body. Hold her in your loving arms and give her strength for each new day. Help her to find you and to know you and to trust you for all things. <clears throat> Be Kenna and Beckham's tower of strength, Lord Jesus. By your word, let her be healed and him be healed as well, in Jesus' name. And Father God, we praise you today for Doug, for getting a job for him. We thank you for this, Lord Jesus. And we pray for Diane for a second job. We just pray that you will place her where you want her to be, Lord God, that she can, can um, uh, minister to others as she does work for you, Lord Jesus, and that she enjoys being at work and loves the new job that you will provide her with. I would also like to pray for safe travels for Mark each and every week as he travels to and from his work. And for Carla and Bill, for safe travels on their vacation as they travel. And uh, clear their paths wherever they may go. Give them many blessings along the way. We want to thank you, Jesus, for divine appointments that you give to each of us to share your word with others, that we may plant the seed and you can make it grow. And Father God, I pray for healing for Steve. By your will, let it be so. Heal his pain, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Father God. 
In 1 John 9 and 10, this is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only Son into the world that we might live through him. This is love, not that we loved God, but that he loves us and sent his Son as an atoning sacrifice for, for our sins. So let us love one another as we should and praise God for everything. Lord, order our steps daily. In Jesus' holy name, amen. I think it's, as I was writing the sermon, I, was, I knew that there would be some divisive, some divisiveness in it. There would be those that might hear it that just shake their head and understand that those are my beliefs based on the God that I serve. And there are people out there that do not serve the same God or do not serve a God at all, don't, don't have any religion at all. And to those I say, we can still be friends. We can still come to that table. I'm, I still want to be able to have conversations with people. And it, it goes right back to what you were just praying. We have to show love, not divisiveness. Psalm 84 says this. How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of heaven's armies. I long, yes, I faint with longing to enter the courts of the Lord. With my whole being, body and soul, I will shout joyfully to the living God. And even the sparrow finds a home, and the swallow builds her nest and raises her young. That is place near your altar. O Lord of heaven's armies, my King and my God, what joy for those who can live in your house, always singing your praises. I pray that people would come to know the Lord so that they could do just that, to live in the house of the Lord, singing his praises. The psalmist goes on to write, what joy for those whose strength comes from the Lord, who have set their minds on a pilgrimage to Jerusalem, as I think about that pilgrimage to Jerusalem, this is a, a, a mental picture for me because it's a spiritual path to God, the pilgrimage back to God. When they walk through the valley of weeping, it will become a place of refreshing springs. The autumn rains will clothe it with blessings. They will continue to grow stronger, and each of them will appear before God in Jerusalem. O Lord God of heaven's armies, hear my prayer. Listen, O God of Jacob. O oh God, look with favor upon the King, our shield. Show favor to the one you have anointed. And the psalmist finishes this with this stanza. He says, a single day in your courts is better than a thousand anywhere else. I would rather be a gatekeeper in the house of my God than live the good life in the homes of the wicked. For the Lord God is our sun and our shield. He gives us grace and glory. The Lord will withhold no good thing from those who do what is right. O Lord of heaven's armies, what joy for those who trust in you. We need to hold steadfast, but we need to do so in truth and love. As we end our online portion of the service, I leave you with this blessing. May the Lord bless you and protect you. May the Lord smile on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord show you his favor and give you his peace. Go in.